really happy to be here again and good afternoon to all our listeners, all our viewers. And we are doing um, important relationship skills for healthy relationships and not going into my normal recap because this one is a little long and I want to finish, right? So of course we're doing empathy. Part two, empathy is a critical skill if we have to have healthy relationships. And so what part two is, part two really is how to communicate with empathy, how to communicate with empathy. And as I would always hear me say, empathy is one of the most important abilities or skills that help people to understand each other and you cannot, you just cannot have healthy, intimate relationships without empathy. And remember, when I'm talking about intimate relationships, I'm speaking about friendships, um, romantic relationships, spouses, even parent-child relationships. All of those relationships are considered intimate in that it is a given and receiving of love. There's a certain amount of vulnerability in those relationships. And empathy is the basis for emotional closeness in a relationship. And we know that empathy is the ability to step into the shoes of another person with the aim to understand their feelings and perspective. But it's not just to understand it, eh? it is to use that understanding to guide your actions. And remember, when I'm talking about actions, I'm not just talking about things we do, but also what we see. So what we do, what we see. So today, part two of empathy, how do we show or communicate empathy? One, to do this, we must have we must first be willing to feel our own feelings. We have to tell ourselves that feelings are neither right nor wrong and feelings cannot harm us. Of course, sometimes they really do feel like they're harming us, <laughs> right? Um, what is right or wrong is how we think and what we do. So things happen, as we, we spoke about this, I spoke about this a number of times, things happen, chemicals produce, we have emotions, we put cognition or think into it, we get feelings, right? And we understand, okay, I feel this or I feel that. That is neither right nor wrong. What is right or wrong is how we think and how we behave. So I allow myself to feel what I feel and I decide what I'm going to think and do. So I feel like this, but then I need to decide what I am going to think and I am going to do. So we understand we don't allow feelings to run the show. But if we are not aware and conscious of how we feel, let me tell you something, they are going to run the show. The way they don't run the show is when we allow ourselves to feel them. So for example, every morning, Michelle comes into the office, says good morning to everyone, right? But me. So I, I should throw Tiffany in there. Every morning, I come into the studio. I tell her everybody morning. And only Tiffany wouldn't respond. She wouldn't say good morning, right? She never answers. And of course, um, I'm not aware that I did anything to Tiffany. I, I, I don't recall doing anything. I didn't steal her lunch. I didn't you know, go on her desk and steal her pen, right? And of course, I feel rejected. I feel embarrassed. I feel confused because she's talking, laughing with everybody else. And I'm, I am aware that she has heard me, right? I think about it. So I decide, okay, let me speak to her about it. I don't want to just leave it there. Let me speak to her about it. And of course, she is very dismissive. dismissive. She doesn't know what I'm talking about. You, you know, people can do that, right? You all, well, I don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> right? Very dismissive, don't know what I'm talking about. So of course, I feel rejected. I feel like a fool for sharing, right? And I am fully aware of how I feel. I don't deny, I don't repress my feelings. I think about it, right? So I decide to think and I'm saying, what can I do to stop feeling like this? Well, for one, I need to forgive Tiffany because I really feel hurt by her behavior, 
right? And remember, forgiveness is releasing pain for God to heal. We don't want to be walking around with a whole lot of pain and everything starts impacting us and we end up bitter and resentful, right? So my first thing, I forgive Tiffany. I pray and ask God to bless her and to heal her and deliver her. You know, it's very important to use God's technology and we don't, when people treat us badly, just, you know, want to say all kind of bad things. We do what God says. We pray for them. We ask God to bless them. We ask God to heal them. And then I need to change my expectations. I need to somehow, right? I need to stop believing that she would give me the normal courtesies, normal manners of good morning, Petries, right? I need to stop looking for it. It may be a little uncomfortable, you know, in the beginning, um, but it does not affect my worth. I am still priceless whether Tiffany decides to acknowledge me, tell me morning or not. I am still, it does not affect my productivity. I'm still going in there and going to be productive, right? So yes, a little uncomfortable, but after a while, you know what, I'll be okay, right? I will still say good morning to everyone, including her, right? Because I believe it is the right thing to do. No, because I allowed myself to feel, really feel, I was able to address the situation in a healthy manner, but just as important, I know what it feels like to feel embarrassed, dismissed, unimportant. So I can empathize with someone who has these similar feelings. So the first thing, if we have to be empathetic, we have to be willing to feel our own feelings. And like it or not, God gave feelings that are important. Feelings help us to understand our lives. Feelings help us to know when something is wrong and there are things we need to work on and things we need to change. Feelings help us to empathize with others. Feelings help us to enjoy life. So it's not something we could just decide feelings this feelings thing is not important we don't allow feelings to govern our lives so i don't act the way i feel i act based on truth principles values facts right well at least most of the time <laughs> most of the time so um now being defensive and having deep insecurities can stop us from being able to feel what another person is feeling, especially if it is our actions that cause the pain. So um, a lot of times we don't want to think that we are wrong or that we are hurting someone that we love a lot of times because our identity isn't being good or being right. That is what makes us feel good about ourselves. So when we have to be able to look at, wait now, Petris, you're wrong. You did hurt a loved one. You're not as good as you think. I could become defensive, right? Because I really don't want to feel that or to hear that. Hear that. And that is why very important um, defensiveness and deep insecurities are very damaging to intimate relationships. And if you find yourself being very defensive, I was once upon a time a defensive person and I really needed to deal with it, right? I really needed to, to be able to forgive and be able to allow God to become my source for identity, right? So God knows the good, bad, and ugly about me, and he loves me. And I can also tell people the good, bad, and ugly about me and be okay. You know why? Not because they love me, you know, because God loves me <laughs> and my identity is in him, right? So first thing, we need to be willing to feel our feelings, acknowledge them. We need to be able to do that. Secondly, we have to believe that every human being has feelings. Every human being has feelings. I've actually heard people say that um, he has no feelings, she has no feelings. And it's, it's never the truth. That is not the truth, right? No matter how cool a person may seem, he or she has feelings. Now, there are many things that stop people from wanting to feel their feelings. A few of them, are, so I listed seven. I mean, here I listed seven. Four, I listed four, right? These are reasons why people may not want to feel their feelings. One, they have been taught that their feelings are not important. 
And this can happen through the experiences. So many of the things that we learn may not have been things that have been told to us, but we learn these things through our experiences. So through the experiences, they may have learned that feelings are not important, right? And what has actually been, some people, this has actually been said to them, you know, feelings not important, feelings not important. So that is a reason why some people don't even allow themselves to tap into what am I really feeling? But like it or not, when we're not conscious of what we're feeling, they are still impacting us and sometimes controlling our lives. There are many people not doing certain things because they don't even realize how much they are controlled by fear, that feeling of fear. So what is fear of commitment, fear of failure, fear of the unknown, and that feeling of fear, which they're not tapping into and being able to deal with and resolve, they're being controlled by that. Um, fear of rejection. So don't feel that just because I am not aware doesn't of the feelings that they're not impacting me in some type of way right another reason why people may not want to feel their feelings is that they have been hurt deeply by loved ones and have, they've never dealt with it and they never want to feel those emotions again so there's a part of them that they kind of keep closed off and locked off because i really don't want to feel pain i don't want to feel certain things Thirdly, they don't want to feel vulnerable and they associate feelings with weakness. So many times people can associate feelings with weakness. And I mean, the, 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 the most powerful being in the universe, God, so many times throughout even the Old Testament express how he felt, even with respect to how he felt with Israel going after other gods. And, you know, he equated it to, to adultery, a very painful experience. Um, so it's amazing how the most powerful being in the universe um, is able to feel and to show himself vulnerable. So we have to know that being vulnerable and and feeling your feelings is actually not a sign of weakness right and Jesus wept and um Jesus felt he was going to he was going to raise Lazarus you know <laughs> Lazarus was coming back you know but Jesus saw what death and sin has done to mankind and Jesus showed his emotions he wept openly number four they have seen how people took advantage of empathetic persons and they have decided that they are, this is not going to happen to them. So sometimes, you know, you grow up with persons who are very empathetic and empathetic, but probably not having healthy um, boundaries and, and balance. And these very empathetic persons were taken advantage of by others. And they say, you see me, I'm not going to be soft like Jerry. I'm not going to be soft like Jim or Michelle or Karen, not me. And we associate, you know, being empathetic with people taking advantage of another one, of another person, right? So these are some of the reasons why people may decide, mm -mm, um, I don't want this, this, this empathy. I don't want this empathy thing, right? But we have to believe that everyone has feelings, right? And everyone needs empathetic understanding. So we have to understand that every person is layered with softer and more vulnerable materials below what seems like that successful, have everything under control demeanor. So you know a lot of people, you look at them and they, oh my goodness, he looks so well put together, like everything is always in control. He always says the right thing. My God, she always on point, says everything beautifully, never seems to be falling apart, never seems to be having a bad day, not even a bad hair day, right? Everything always looks top, top of the line. But that is not real, eh? no matter who it is, no. Everything is not always okay. When Adam and Eve sinned, 
life became difficult for everyone, right? So we have to know that people are layered. They are layered. So if we have to be able to listen with empathy and to communicate empathy, we need to try to get a sense of the softer feelings, fear or shame or loneliness, rejection that are usually behind the anger or the tough face that people sometimes put on. Because, you know, sometimes you're feeling scared, you know, but you don't want anybody to know. So it could come out a bit, it could come a bit rough, you know, or a bit harsh, but really it is because I'm feeling scared, right? Remember that anger, frustration, annoyed, irritated, upset, even jealousy is a secondary emotion right? Which means that there are the softer primary emotions below those hard protective emotions. Jealousy is not a primary emotion. Jealousy is in the angry family of emotions. Below jealousy really is feeling not good about yourself. If people feel really good about themselves, they don't feel jealous in the sense of, I'm not talking about with intimate relations or whatever. I'm talking about somebody having something they don't have or, you know, things like that. Imagine the insecure, scared, suffering person behind the other person's eyes, right? Think about how childhood and other experiences could have affected his or her thoughts, feelings, and wants. So you, 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 you're dealing with someone and they act like feelings not important to them. Not true. And in dealing with them, that's why I'm saying you need to know that people are layered. So you want to get to below the softer, more vulnerable emotions. You want to think about their childhood their experiences and how those things can be affecting them. And you want to think about what the person would want to feel loved, to feel safe, and to feel valued. All of these things help us to be able to empathize with another person. Now, there is something called alexithymia. alexithymia. It is a condition, it's not a condition, sorry, in its own right, but an inability to identify and describe your feelings. People with alexithymia have difficulties recognizing and communicating their own emotions, and they also struggle to recognize and respond to emotions in others, right? Um, so it is not a mental health disorder, but it has links with post-traumatic stress disorder, eating disorders, and various other conditions, and it can occur with autism. So you have people who genuinely, genuinely struggle to identify their own emotions and also the emotions in others. And sometimes I can see this in clients if their upbringing was very traumatic. So they have like post-traumatic stress. They may have grown up in a home where, you know, there was a lot of violence and they really feel traumatized. So it's very difficult for them to actually say how they feel and even see those cues in others that says that a person um, is feeling this or feeling that. So there are people who struggle. Number three, we need to do active listening. So of course, if you're just tuning in, we're looking at empathy part two, and we're looking at how to communicate with empathy. And we say the first thing you need to do is to be able to feel your own feelings. Secondly, we need to, to believe that all human beings have feelings. All human beings feel. Thirdly, we need to do active listening. Now, active listening is listening to understand. That is what active listening. So I am listening to truly hear and understand. A lot of times when we listen, we listen to respond or to, or to give a solution or to give an opinion, right? So we need to do it. We have to be empathetic. We have to listen 
to understand, we need to do active listening. So in active listening, firstly, you need to give your full attention. Give the speaker your undivided attention. Remember that nonverbal communication also speaks very loudly. So the attention and that you're looking at them, you're giving them your full attention. You know, we're not doing the, I hear any, I don't need to see it to hear you. No, if you're being empathetic, you also need to look at, at body language. So a person's tone of voice, facial expressions, how they move, they mean a lot, they say a lot, right? Um, put aside your distractions, decide you're really going to listen to understand, right? Do not rebut or try to prove wrong what the person is saying. So try not to interrupt them, right? And do not be distracted by the environment or your own inner thoughts. Pay attention. And that's that could be very easy. In the earlys in my marriage, I realized I really was not a good listener. So I listened really well when it came to my job and it comes to ministry. But when it came to home, uh -huh, he be talking to me. I done studying. Okay, what meat I need to take out the season for tomorrow, please go on. And, and then after he telling me, but remember we said this, I, I, you never told me this. I can't remember. And I said it so much that I realized, no, this can't be about him. He actually has a better memory than me. This has to be me. And I would not, um, mm -mm, I wasn't good at listening. And I literally had to buckle down ask God for his grace. So now I'm much, much, much better. So I'm saying to all you not good listeners listening to me is a skill so you can get better because I surely did. I'm much, 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 much better. Um, secondly, if you want to do active listening or listening to understand, show that you're listening. Show that you're listening. Use your body language, your gestures to show that you're really listening. You know, you nod. Um, you smile if it's appropriate, use other facial expressions, make sure that your posture is relaxed, you know, like an open posture, don't fold your arms, encourage the speaker to continue by using, you know, small verbal comments like yes, mm -hmm, okay, these things that, that people know you're really listening to them, right, but the thing about it is when we really want to listen, it can normally be seen in our body language, so you can normally see somebody body language if they're listening. And what is good about listening to understand, you're so focused on understanding the person, it helps to silence all that is going on in you. Normally, if we listen to respond or we listen to give a solution or to give our opinion, a lot of what is going on in us could be impacting our ability to listen, right? Number three, provide some kind of feedback. Um, it involves you. So when we're talking about feedback, the feedback that you're giving is not your opinion or solving a problem or trying to show the person where they're wrong. The feedback is to ensure that you truly understand, right? Remember, you have your own personal filters, your assumptions, your judgments, your beliefs, and these things can distort what you are hearing right? With a mindset to listen, you really want to understand what your loved one is saying. And, and this may require you to think about and reflect on what is being said and ask questions. So this is the type of feedback I'm talking about. So you, you want to be able to say, okay, paraphrase or summarize, you know, what I'm hearing is, and probably just paraphrase, summarize it, right? Or it sounds like you're saying, paraphrase, summarize. Is that what you're saying? So you're making sure I'm truly hearing, I'm truly understanding. You can even ask questions to, to clarify certain points. What do you mean when you said? And it's not in any defensive way. I truly want to understand what you meant when you said, or you ask, is this what you mean? So when we're talking about providing feedback, in active listening or listening to understand, it is to ensure that I'm truly understanding, I'm truly hearing you. And allow the speaker to finish each point before asking questions. You know, don't interrupt. And especially don't interrupt with your viewpoint or your opinion or to prove, you see, you don't know English. You're using that word wrong. 
That is not what that word means. Oh, but you know what the person is trying to say, though. Right? Don't be like that now. Love, love. Right? So now, for the person who is speaking, remember that a person can only listen for so long. <laughs> so please don't go on and on and on and on and on. That could be very difficult for somebody who's listening to you. So you are speaking and you would like a person to understand and to be empathetic. Please limit if it possible you're speaking to about two, three minutes because after that it could become a bit much for the person to just continue listening and you're going on and on and on, right? And for us ladies, we do this really, really well. Please, if we're talking to men, one point at a time, please. The three and four and five points and sticking on this point to this point, it really does something to their brains, right? So we try to do one point at a time. So you have actively listened, you have listened to understand, and now you want to respond appropriately with empathy, right? Um, so how to respond with empathy, because you're listening, you're gaining information, you're gaining perspective, and you now want to respond with empathy. Number one, restate what you heard them say. That's the, the first thing, right? Um, it really sounds like, so it's a brief summary, and it's in brief, briefer of the comment, acknowledging their feelings. So, you restating what you heard them say, so a little content, but you're acknowledging their feelings. So for example, it really sounds like you feel powerless and scared, right? That, those are the feelings when you see a financial situation, right? So the, the person was talking about the financial situation and you could identify there's a powerlessness, there's a fear that they feel. So it really sounds like you feel powerless and scared. Those are feelings when you see our financial situation and you, you're going on and you feel disappointed feeling that I made a decision to make these purchases at this time. So, Summary, so you, different situations, you say the feeling, you give context, context. What is the context? So restate what you heard them say. Second, just two things, and your restatement with a checkout question, which is, have I understood? Is that what you're feeling? That is important because in empathizing, we can get it wrong and there's no problem with that. Just the fact that the person sees you trying to get what they're feeling already brings a feeling of comfort, a feeling of connection, a feeling of, of closeness, of, of, of peace, right? So not all the time we may get all the feelings right. And because we want to be on the same page to be able to move forward together, we need to have that checkout question. So is that how you're feeling? Is this what you're feeling? Have I understood, right? You ask that. So it really sounds like you feel powerless and scared when you see our financial situation and you feel disappointed that I made the decision to make these purchases at this time. Is that how you feel? And the person may say, I feel scared and disappointed, but I don't feel powerless. But I also felt disrespected because we didn't discuss it. So you see, I get more, something that you didn't, didn't consider, right? And that is why it is so important to have that checkout question. So when we are to, to communicate with empathy, we need to first listen actively. Then we need to restate what you heard them say, brief 
brief content acknowledging feelings. So it seems you feel, or I could hear that you feel because of so, so, so. And then we end that with a checkout question. Is that what you feel? Do I understand what you're saying? Right? And give the person an opportunity to say, yes, that's exactly how I feel. Right? Or the person to say, yes, I feel those things, but I also feel, or I feel this, but I don't feel that. Right? Very critical. So another example sounds like you are really disappointed and angry about the way your friends treated you after the concert, and you are not quite sure what to do. Is that it? That's a checkout question. If your restatement is close to accurate, the other person will confirm by saying yes, or they will just tell you more because they realize that you got it, you understand, right? No, so I hope you all understand that. Restate what you heard them say, end your restatement with a checkout question. When should we use empathy or when should we respond with empathy? We use empathy when someone seems to be sharing verbally or non-verbally some emotion or emotions. Empathy is not only for things that are painful, but things that are wonderful. Imagine your spouse coming home and sharing with you that he just got commended by all his senior managers at his work on the project he's been working on for the last month. And you respond, oh, great, darling. We eaten at eight o'clock, eh? Right? That, uh, right? So empathy is not just for painful things. It's also for wonderful things. So Tiffany shares something wonderful with me. And I say, okay, that's nice, but I'm not coming on the program Monday. In her mind, all right, well, I know who not to share with when things happen in my life, <laughs> right? You understand? <laughs> Good. So also remember that feelings of anger, frustration, or irritation are all in the angry family of emotions. So they are secondary emotions. They are primary emotions underlying those emotions of anger. So whether it's disappointment, fear, feeling unloved, feeling disrespected, feeling unheard, un unsupported, alone, all of these things. So a lot of times you want to get below those emotions. So we use empathy when someone seems to be sharing verbally or non-verbally some emotion or emotions. And remember, it's not just for difficult or painful emotions. Secondly, we use empathy to resolve conflict with a better understanding, a better idea of the feelings and wants of our significant others, of our loved ones. We are more able to solve problems together. When we are in tune with each other's feelings, wants, needs, and we understand how our behaviors are impacting each other for good or for bad, right? This empathetic understanding will help us to find the healthy way forward in resolving conflict. Additionally, when our spouse or friends or loved ones feel understood, he or she is more willing to extend understanding to us. Once a person's needs for survival are met, so food, shelter, clothing, those things are met. The deepest question of all in any important relationship is, do you understand me? Until it is answered with a yes, that question will keep troubling the waters of that relationship. So we have food, shelter, clothing, good. We're not struggling, we're not thinking for that anymore. My next thing is, do you, mommy, do you understand me? Daddy, do you understand me? Friend, do you understand me? Husband, wife, do you understand me? And when we don't feel understood, we really feel alone. So this is very, very, very important. So until it is answered with a yes, the 
right? That will keep troubling the waters of the relationship. When understanding is continually refreshed by new empathy, our relationships stay strong. Another um, important use of empathy is to have a confrontation. So let's say you want to confront a friend about her foul language or, or cursing, right? When she's angry. So this friend, she would really curse when she's angry. You start with empathy, right? I know that you sometimes feel angry and powerless, right? So that those are the feelings in your situation with your husband. And because he has hurt you, you really feel like you want to hurt him back and you use words to do this. That is starting a confrontation and to confront means to bring something to the front. So bring something there that someone doesn't see, right? Um, and you say then, can we look at that hurt and find another way with God's help to deal with this situation? So you don't just go and tell the person about a foul language. You, when you start with empathy, the person realizes, okay, this person gets it, this person, right? So starting a confrontation with an empathetic statement helps the person to not feel attacked or judged. And so instead of becoming defensive and closed off, he or she is more open to listening to what you have to share, right? Um, so let me see if I could finish something in a minute so I could give you all some time to call. <laughs> I actually found a really um, good article from Dr. Margaret Paul on empathy and compassion, essentials for loving relationships. And I'm sharing from that article and I'm quoting, Problems also arise when one partner, due to his or her level of empathy and compassion, cares more deeply about the other person's happiness and fulfillment, but the other partner, due to shutting down their inability to empathize or not develop this ability, does not support the other's desire for fulfillment. It is only when individuals are able to stay open to empathy and compassion for themselves and others, even when angry or upset, that they are reliable in their caring. Because caring goes out of the window when there's no empathy and compassion. The partner on the other end of this may feel as if they are walking on eggshells. They never know when the caring will be gone. Those people who have maintained a deep level of compassion and empathy for others need to respect and value themselves enough to be empathetic and compassionate to themselves. They need to make sure that their empathy and compassion for others does not mean that they allow themselves to be abused or disrespected in their relationships. Those people who have shut down their empathy and compassion can begin to be open to it again by deciding to be open about childhood wounds and allowing themselves to be healed. It is unlikely that if you shut down your compassion when you were a small child, you will be able to feel deep empathy and compassion for others until you feel it for yourself. People who didn't shut down as children can feel it for others without feeling it for themselves, which is what often makes them into caretakers so they will take care of, this is me speaking now, or just going off the, 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 the um, article, take care of everybody, but not take care of themselves, right? They give, going back to the article, they give their care into others, but not to themselves. Caretakers often partner with takers 
who have shut down their compassion for others and just want to get it from the caretaker. So a lot of times people who are caretakers end up with people who are takers, right? The caretaker ends up feeling very lonely because he or she is caring about others, but no one, including themselves, is caring about them. Relationships achieve growth and fulfillment when both partners are intent on developing empathy and compassion for themselves and for each other. Without empathy and compassion, there is no true intent to learn, end of quote. Now, as Christians, if you are struggling with empathy in your relationship, start with your relationship with Jesus. Develop intimacy there or your relationship with your heavenly father, right? Develop intimacy there where you share all your feelings and your actions with God, the good, the bad, the ugly, knowing that he loves you and he can give you the help and the healing that is needed. And in closing, remember, it is amazing and comforting that what we find in Hebrews 4, 15 to 16, speaking about Jesus as our high priest. And it says, this high priest of ours understands our weakness for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it the most. Wow. We have a God. We have a God who understands, who empathizes, right, with us. So if our God is an empathetic God, which we know because he should have really destroyed all of us, he didn't. He did the empathetic thing, right? It means that at his feet, in his presence is a place that we can also learn empathy.